Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are back at it today talking about the readings for Wednesday of the 20th week in Ordinary Time. And oh my goodness, what huge readings we have for today. In our first reading, uh, as you know, we are working through the prophet Ezekiel at this time in the church uh, calendar. Um, Ezekiel is this uh, edgy prophet that uh, often uses um, some envelope-pushing imagery in his various oracles. Uh, he was a priest who served in the Jerusalem temple, was taken into exile when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem in 597 BC. He wrote most of his prophecies while in Babylon in the decade between 597 to about 587 when Jerusalem was destroyed. And then he had some additional prophecies all the way up to the year 572, which is about the last date that we have um, of any of his oracles uh, in his prophetic book. So um, Ezekiel lived at the very end of the Judean monarchy when the last sons of David were sitting on the throne of Jerusalem. And then Ezekiel lived into the period that we call the exile or the Babylonian exile, which is roughly between 597 and about 537 BC. Around 537, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians and the Persian emperor Cyrus, beginning around the year 535 BC, began to send the Judeans back to their homeland and, or at least allow them to return to the homeland if they wanted to. And then we have what we call the post-exilic period when uh, Jerusalem was rebuilt and restored and at least the, uh, the region of Judea was repopulated, or Judah uh, means the same thing, was repopulated and reconstituted as a political entity, although not a kingdom because they did not get the son of David back. All right, so that was a little bit of historical background about the prophet Ezekiel. And today we have a very, very famous chapter from Ezekiel here. We have Ezekiel's good shepherd prophecy. This is huge. This uh, chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, corresponds to John 10, which is Jesus's uh, Good Shepherd Discourse. Now, the book of Ezekiel goes hand in hand with the Gospel of John because the Apostle John drew heavily from the prophetic book of Ezekiel, and certain chapters of John draw heavily on certain chapters of Ezekiel. So, John 11, which is the raising of Lazarus, draws heavily from the vision of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, whereas John 10, which is the Good Shepherd Discourse, draws heavily on this chapter, Ezekiel 34, which is our first reading. I'll read just a little bit of it. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. In these words, prophesy to them, to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been pasturing themselves. Should not shepherds rather pasture sheep? You have fed off their milk, worn their wool, slaughtered the fatlings, but the sheep you have not pastured. You did not strengthen the weak or heal the sick, bind up the injured, did not bring back the strayed or seek the lost, but you lorded it over them harshly and brutally. So the passage goes on to criticize the leaders of Judea, who would be the kings and the priests and even the false prophets, who were abusing and misusing the people and not caring for them. And this goes on for quite some time as the, as the Lord criticizes them using this metaphor of shepherds. And then at the end, God says, I am going to come one day and I personally am going to shepherd my sheep. The final statement says, for thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. And that's what Jesus is talking about in John 2, where he likens himself to the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is saying, basically, I have come to fulfill this prophecy from Ezekiel 34. I am the good shepherd. You may be interested to know that also the account of the feeding of the 5,000 in all of the Gospels, but especially in John 6 and Mark 6, draw from this chapter of Ezekiel. And you see Jesus doing shepherdy things in the feeding of the 5,000. 
because he leads the people up onto the mountain heights of Israel, up into the mountains, and the mountains are mentioned in Ezekiel 34. And there, where there's very good pasture, and both Mark and John make note of the fact that there was grass or good pasture up in those mountains, there um, Jesus makes the people lie down before he feeds them. And that's one of the things that's said in Ezekiel 34 is that the Lord will come as a good shepherd and make his people lie down in good pasture and then feed them. So that whole uh, feeding of the 5,000 account in the Gospels is very much drawing on Ezekiel 34 uh, because Jesus was feeding the people of Israel like a shepherd feeds his flock. And we should also remember that the Gospel accounts of the feeding of the 5,000 are full of Eucharistic imagery. Um, for example, John uses five or six terms in his description of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 that are only used elsewhere in the institution narratives, I should say only used elsewhere together in the institution narratives in the other Gospels describing our Lord establishing the, the Eucharist slash Last Supper. So, um, what we can get out of this as Christians is that it is through the Eucharist that our Lord shepherds us, or at least we could say the Eucharist itself is one of the primary ways that our Lord expresses his shepherd nature toward us. Because in the Eucharist, we feed on that good pasture provided by God. Um, it is uh, the best pasture because it is God himself who comes into us and feeds us. And that's an important point that's going to come up in the uh, gospel, actually, ironically. The idea of God himself being our reward or our sustenance or our food or our pay. Okay, so the Eucharist is God himself come to us to feed us. That's the best kind of shepherding you can have where the shepherd gives his own body uh, to be eaten by the sheep. And that's the message also of the psalm for today, which is Psalm 23. Very appropriate because Ezekiel was drawing on the imagery of Psalm 23 as under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he composed that oracle that we read in the first reading. And then we read this famous psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. See how that's like Jesus making the people lie down on the, on the grassy uh, mountainside in the feeding of the 5,000. By restful waters he leads me, he refreshes my soul. Uh, the church fathers understood the imagery of Psalm 23 to refer to the sacraments. So the, uh, the verdant pastures is the Eucharist. The restful waters are baptism. Um, uh, the table spread before us in the sight of our foes, that's also the Eucharist. The anointing of the head with oil is either confirmation or um, uh, uh, anointing of the sick. My cup overflows, that's the Eucharistic cup. And all of all the, what, what do the sacraments do? The sacraments lead to eternal life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come, or other, other translations say forever, um, which uh, you know, it basically means an indefinite length of time. It just continues and continues. All right, so the first reading in Psalm are beautiful. Now, one might think that uh, you know, the, the feeding of the 5,000 might be an appropriate gospel, but we're reading the gospel in order here, and so we're up to Matthew 20. But we're going to see that in, the, in God's providence, that first reading does have a connection here uh, with, uh, with this gospel. What is the gospel? Well, it is the parable of the landowner and the day laborers. So our Lord says, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out at about 9 o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and we know how the parable goes. The landowner keeps going back to the marketplace. He hires different cohorts of laborers all through the day. These different cohorts work different amounts of time, but at the end of the day, they all queue up, and the landowner pays them all the same wage. He, he gives to each one a denarius, which is about, you know, modern equivalent of, say, 60 bucks or so. 
about a mu as much money as a minimum wage laborer could make in a typical day's work. So uh, they all get a, a denarius, and then the ones who were called first complain about this. Uh, they feel like they should have gotten more, and the landowner says, uh, why are you envious? Are you envious because I'm generous? The last will be first and the first will be last. Okay, so what is this parable talking about? Well, it, it's in the, in the beginning it sounds like, well, this sounds unfair. It, Jesus seems to be saying that no matter what you do for the kingdom, uh, the reward's going to be the same. And so you might wonder, well, why... Uh, why should I work harder than anybody else? Why should I make sacrifices for the sake of holiness, etc.? So, is God really fair? That's the question here. Is God fair to give the same wage to all who turn to them, no matter when they convert, whether they serve him from childhood throughout their whole life, or whether they're a deathbed conversion? Um, is, is it fair for God to give the same wage to each one? Well, I'm going to say, yes, it is, but we have to understand what is the wage that God gives to those who are faithful to him? Well, the wage that he gives is himself, okay? God is the denarius, so to speak. Or we could also make an Eucharistic application, since the Eucharist is God himself. We could say the denarius is the Eucharist. But the reward for serving God is to receive God himself. And everybody is going to receive God in heaven. That's the meaning of the beatific vision. That's the meaning of heaven. In heaven, we will experience God directly. We will receive God. We'll be in total communion with him. Okay, All of us, whether we converted late in life or whether we served God in fidelity uh, since childhood. Now, you might ask the question, well, why then... Is it worth serving God for a long period of time? Why don't I just, uh, you know, commit sins and then have a deathbed conversion because I'm going to get the same reward as everybody else? Well, there's many reasons why not to do that. It's a very risky strategy for one thing. But the other reason is this. Although we are all going to receive God in heaven, our capacity to enjoy God is increased through holiness and especially through the suffering without which there can be no gain in holiness. Let's use an analogy. Say two people go to uh, the same performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and one is a lifelong musician who began playing violin when he was a child and, and really gave himself to the art of music and, and has had a rich uh, experience as a musician all his life. And the other, is just a person who recently, you know, heard his first piece of classical music and is just kind of getting into classical music. So they both go to this fantastic performance by, I don't know, the London Philharmonic of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And at the end of the symphony, the musician is just completely in tears, just completely overwhelmed. He had a transcendent experience. He can't believe what he just heard. This is the most ecstatic performance he's, he's ever witnessed. He just moved to tears and he's experienced God through this performance of, of, this, of this great symphony. Whereas the, the, the neophyte is like, well, that was pretty good. I like that. You know, I, I enjoyed that. That was a great concert. I'm impressed. Okay. Well, look at those two persons. Their capacity to enjoy that experience is radically different based on what they have given of themselves uh, during their lifetimes. And that is a small analogy, an imperfect analogy, as all analogies are, but a, 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 an imperfect but nonetheless uh, um, helpful analogy to understanding heaven. Um, so, why is it worth laboring in the vineyard all day long? It's worth it because that labor in the vineyard increases our capacity for God. And then when we see him face to face in the beatific vision, our subjective experience is going to be so much richer, we will not regret one sacrifice we have ever made for Christ. <laughs> Let me emphasize that. No one will ever regret 
a single sacrifice that they made for the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. You will never regret it. Because the satisfaction that comes from having your soul expanded so that you can receive God uh, more fully. Okay. In one sense, objectively, we are all going to receive the same pay. Um, but those of us that freely give ourselves uh, will never regret that uh, in, in the deeper intimacy that we are going to be able to have with God. And everyone will be satisfied. Everyone will be fully satisfied. All the sheep will be fully satisfied, but some more than others because some's, some capacity, some's capacity, if that's a word, uh, some of the sheep's capacity for satiation uh, will be so much greater by having shared in the labors of uh, the shepherd. Uh, now, the, those who complain in the parable don't have the right attitude. They don't regard laboring in the vineyard as sharing with the landowner. They, they're not in love with the landowner. That's the problem. They don't love the landowner and they don't think of their work as sharing in his work. They think of it as just time that they're putting in for some kind of, um, you know, uh, recompense. Um, but let us not have this kind of mercantile perspective that these laborers have. Uh, let us regard our labors in holiness, our, our sacrifices that we put forward to grow closer to the Lord in this life. Let us regard them as acts of love by which we enter more deeply into the experience of God and uh, enter more deeply into that spousal love that I like to talk about so often, that hesed that we've talked about before. So let's, uh, let's make uh, our journey not something that's tit for tat and economic, but is a journey of love in entering more deeply into the intimacy of communion with God, whom we will receive fully in the age to come. Well, I could talk so much more about this, but I think I've laid out enough ideas that you can see what the major point is there. So let us labor for God who will feed us with himself. This is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville talking about the readings for Wednesday of the 20th week of Ordinary Time.